Hello everyone, this is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics. For our six month anniversary, we've decided to talk about the politics of millennials. And I am here today with my favorite millennial, my co-host Sophie. Hey Sophie. Hey Kelly. So you youngin. So for everyone, <laughs> I am very much not a millennial. <laughs> So we're going to talk a little bit about how we're going to define these terms of what a millennial is and what that means and some stereotypes around millennials. So Sophie, what's a millennial? Well, some people might be surprised to learn that millennials are not teenagers. I've heard a lot of talk, particularly on social media, about millennials connected to the teenagers who are protesting on behalf of gun control and, and gun control legislation. I've heard you know, references to people who are 17, 18, and that's not really accurate. Pew Research, which is my favorite source of definitions for generational research, uh, defines millennials as people born between 1981 and 1996. So I am a millennial. I was born in 1985. And even my husband is a millennial. He was born in 1982. But that means that really the youngest millennials are about 21 right now. So they're all adults, not even most of them college students. Most of most millennials have graduated from college if they went to college. Just for some context, uh, everybody born after 1996, Pew has not yet determined what that generation will be called. They're just calling them the post-millennial generation. Mm -hmm. I know the New York Times was sort of fishing around recently to get people to name the the post-millennial generation. And some people have referred to it as Generation Z, just like occasionally millennials get referred to as Generation Y. That, of course, is because Generation X was before the millennials. That's people born between 1965 and 1980. And the baby boomers, which I think is probably the best known named generation, is from 1946 to 1964. The silent generation, which I didn't know much about until I started doing generational research a few years ago, those are people born from 1928 to 1945. And the greatest generation is people born from 1901 to 1927. So I am Generation X. But recently there's been talk about a micro generation <laughs> called Xennial. <laughs> Pew does not use Xennial, but some of the other uh, <laughs> less credible researchers perhaps do. Uh, so Xennial is... People who were born, I think it's fine. People who were born between when the first Star Wars movie came out and the third one came out, <laughs> or episode four and episode six. So I was born in 1978, so I fit into that. I am exennial. Uh, basically, it's the Oregon Trail micro generation. But see, I totally played Oregon Trail growing up. I mean, I was all about, you know, shooting those bears. <laughs> Dying of typhoid. Dying of typhoid. You know, I bro I died of broken limbs quite a lot. Mm, yeah. Which was sort of confusing to me as a child. Yeah. So you're a you're a young generation X, and I'm a old millennial. Yes. Yeah. We're not really that far apart. You know, and it really breaks down when you get to things like my brother is technically a millennial, and you know, there's only three and a half years between us. We're really not that different in age. We grew up with mm -hmm. basically the same media, the same, you know, exposure to computers and all of that. But you got to draw the line somewhere, I guess. My husband, by the way, who was born in 77, very much rejects this idea of micro generations. He, he <laughs> doesn't like the idea of generations that much as being a useful concept to think about. Because, you know, mm -hmm. to him, generations should be people and their kids are the next generation and mm -hmm. their kids are the next generation and grouping a whole bunch of people together doesn't make a lot of sense. So for mm -hmm. that, you know, you might refer to people as cohorts instead of generations. It gets tricky though, because if you're like my family and you have children very late in life as a rule, and I'm talking about like back to my great grandparents, then you don't line up with a lot of other people's sort of generation. My husband's grandparents are all in a different generation than my grandparents are. All my grandparents were greatest generation, and all of my husband's grandparents were silent generation. You get off a little bit by one or two if you're like my family, and you, you tend to have children after 30 or after 35. Well, and, you know, I'm a young Gen X, and my kids are six and three, they are definitely mm -hmm. not millennials. They're definitely not the generation after <laughs> me. And who knows when the cutoff will be, 
you know, for whatever this next generation is, they might even be mm-hmm. <laughs> into the next, next one. So I guess I was an old parent. <laughs> <laughs> So, Sophie, is it true that all millennials eat avocado toast every single day? Absolutely 100% true. Um, (laughs) We all eat. In fact, you get assigned, everybody who is a millennial gets assigned an avocado every day. One just shows up at your house for you to make. It's funny because that stereotype is something that a lot of millennials know about and think is funny and work into ordinary conversation, at least in my experience. I've overheard like two different conversations jokingly referring to a, a, uh, referring to avocado toast is the reason, you know, they can't have nice things <laughs> at my place of employment in like the last week. And my place of employment is very heavily millennial because it's, a, it's in the tech sector. So actually millennials are... They are less likely to own their own home, which is sort of part of the avocado toast stereotype. The cliche of the avocado toast came from a fairly recent article, I think maybe a year ago, where a writer opined that, I think it was in some sort of business magazine or personal finance magazine, had opined that millennials could form to own their own homes if they weren't wasting their money on things like avocado toast. (laughs) But millennials do own fewer homes than past generations did when they were the age that millennials are now. So in 1982, 41% of households that were of the age millennials are now, so in their 20s and 30s, owned homes. And in 2016, that's only 35% of that population that owns their own home. But that's probably tied to the fact that millennials tend to live in poverty more. They tend to be doing less well economically than previous generations did at their age. More millennial-headed houses, households live in poverty right now than households headed by members of any other generation. So out of 17 million households that were in poverty, I think this is statistics from 2016, a total of 5.3 million of them are millennial-headed households. Yeah, and on the one hand, that makes a certain amount of sense because the cost of education is going up and up and up. Wages Mm -hmm. have been stagnant for a very long time. But it does defy the stereotype that, you know, when you think of millennials, you think of, right, things like avocado toast and they all own iPhones and they go out and eat Mm -hmm. sushi and, you know, all of that sort of thing that must not actually be happening if people are living in poverty. Mm -hmm. And millennials are actually more likely to be hard workers at their jobs. They're less likely to use vacation time than any other generation. And they're more likely to agree with uh, what this particular study in the Harvard Business Review called work martyr statements, such as, I want to show complete dedication to my company and job, and I feel guilty for using my paid time off. So millennials are really conscientious, which I think fights back against the stereotype that millennials are lazy and entitled and just not willing to work hard for for what they have. And Sophie, how many industries have you personally ruined? (laughs) (laughs) Um, I would say about 15. Okay, great, great. (laughs) Millennials do get blamed a lot for ruining industries, which is funny because I thought I thought that we were super into capitalism in this country. (laughs) I thought like the whole point of capitalism was supposed to be that if you weren't producing goods and services that people wanted to buy or use, that your business went out of business. Like I thought that was the point. No, no, I didn't think it was the consumer's job (laughs) to be propping up businesses, but I guess that's my silly millennial ways. If you could go ahead and ruin the gun industry, I'd be okay with that. (laughs) Millennials are working on that. Do you have any statistics about millennials' voting habits? So millennials do tend to be more democratic than any other generation and more liberal. Right now, Trump's approval rating among millennials is the lowest of any generation. It's at 27%. And millennials tend to hold more liberal uh, perspectives in general. So, for example... 79% of millennials say that immigrants strengthen the country, which is the highest percentage of any generation. Compare that to, say, 66% of Gen X, 56% of boomers, and 47% of silent generation folks. Millennials also tend to be less religious, so that sort of comes up in their voting pattern. 29% of millennials say you must believe in God in order to be moral, which is the lowest percentage of any of any generation. And you can compare that to, for example, the 62% of silent generation folks think that you have to believe in God in order to be moral. So that comes out in their voting patterns as well. 
And especially in today's political climate where there's a lot of racial tension, the fact that millennials are more diverse than any other uh, cohort is also pretty important. Only 56% of millennials in the United States are white compared to 79% of the silent generation is white. So millennials are more diverse. They're more liberal. They make less money. They care a little bit less about religion, at least in terms of what makes you a moral person. So all that sort of, to me, adds up to a force to potentially be reckoned with. So if we could get 100% voter turnout amongst millennials. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a really good We'd be start. all set. We don't need anybody else, just the millennials. If we, and obviously, you know, millennials don't all vote in a block, but millennials overall tend to be much more liberal and to believe believe in, for example, charity and giving to charity. They don't give as much in dollar amounts as older generations, mostly because they as we talked about, don't have as much money, but a bigger percentage of millennials donate to charity than any other generation. So 84% of millennials give to charity every year compared with 59% of Gen Xers and 72% of boomers. My generation's not coming off very well in that stat. (laughs) There's just a little, little bleep there. (laughs) Went down a little bit. I give to charity, guys. It's not my fault. (laughs) Kelly's, I mean, you know, at least 10 of that percentage is you, Kelly. (laughs) I don't think that's how stats work, Sophie. (laughs) (laughs) I don't either, but. (laughs) And what about marriage and relationships? So millennials do tend to cohabitate outside of marriage more frequently than previous generations. But interestingly, they're virtually tied with Gen X in terms of the likelihood of being single mothers. So millennials are more likely to cohabitate outside of marriage or before marriage, but not more likely to have children outside of marriage than Generation X. Yeah, but that's continuing a trend that's been happening over basically since the 1880s, the decline in marriage percentages. Hey, I I cohabited and eventually got married. (laughs) I interestingly did not cohabitate. I, but I got married. I was, I was not your typical millennial in this respect. I got married straight out of college and that's not a typical, a typical millennial thing. I believe the average age now of first marriage is, I'm going to say 25 or 26 and I was 23. So I was younger than the average millennial who got married. I was 30. I'm following that trend. I was 30 when I had my first child, which was also four years, I believe, older than the average age at the birth of a first child for a woman in the United States. So I was a young bride, but an older mother. (laughs) Weird. Not old. I was 33 with my first kid. Not old. I mean, my grandparents were 40 when they had my dad, and my, my parents were almost 40 when they had my sister. So not old at all. I am nearly 40, will not be having kids at nearly 40. I can't imagine, really. <laughs> I don't know. Once you're once you're almost 40, you're like, I don't know, so ground down from the other kids. But... <laughs> I was going to say, where are you going with that once you're almost 40? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So are we missing any important stats about millennials that we should make sure that people know? No, I think those basically just, there's a lot of interesting research out there. Pew has a lot of really great stuff. Um, They've been doing generational research for a long time. So they have really good information and they have cool reports where you can look at comparisons of millennials to other generations in all sorts of ways, economic, political, social, all sorts of stuff. So I recommend going to Pew um, if you're interested in generational research and Sort of checking out what they have there because some of the statistics might surprise you. All right, so we can put some links up for that, and perhaps we will run a contest to name the generation after millennial. I think that'd be a great idea. I'm trying to think what my kids would say. <laughs> <laughs> you should ask them. It would be like Generationosaurus, or. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's better than Ren's answer, which would be Ren, because. <laughs> Anytime you ask him what somebody's name is, he just says Ren. <laughs> I think Teddy and Arthur might both say it. 